And now I have great pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Jean Clinton, who I know will send us out on a high note. Dr. Clinton is Clinical Professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster, Division of Child Psychiatry. She's on staff at McMaster Children's Hospital with cross appointments, pediatrics, family medicine, as an associate in the Department of Child Psychiatry, University of Toronto and Sick Children's Hospital. She's a senior scientist at the Infant Child Health Lab at McMaster. In addition, she's a fellow at the Child Trauma Academy. Dr. Clinton has been a consultant to, to children and youth mental health programs, child welfare, and primary care for almost 30 years. She was recently appointed as education advisor to Premier of Ontario and the minister. We know her from her support and contribution to, his, to how does learning happen. Dr. Clinton is renowned locally, provincially, nationally, and more recently internationally. But for me, and I think for all of my colleagues around the province, this woman is the professor, the scientist, the mom, the grandma, the scientist who helps us understand brain development and the crucial role relationships and connectedness play in that development. She inspires us to practice excellence and helps us find the value and others appreciate the value of our work. So I am so excited to ask you to help me welcome Jean here tonight. Wow, how nice was that? Wow. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Well, you know, I'm, um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I have to say that I'm pumped after that last panel, thinking about finally early childhood educators getting and feeling the recognition that they deserve. I think is absolutely awesome, the work that you're doing, and uh, long, uh, long needed and very much welcome. So congratulations, really. For, I can't believe that it's eight years ago that I was signing everybody's form to get in under the, uh, under the grandfather clause there. Oops. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm going to speak with you for, I think, about 25 minutes. I've got like 40 slides. I'm not going to get through all of them. Uh, but I want to leave, as I've been asked and I love to do, um, uh, is to leave some time for questions. So think... If you've got some questions, I'd be delighted to, uh, uh, to, uh, to speak to them. Um, I have titled this Equity from the Start, and I have to say one of the reasons uh, is I'm going to get these slides into the hands of the Minister of, uh, of Education. She is so into understanding and making sure that we have an Ontario that is equitable for students. And so I really want her to get the message that the work that you all do is building equity right from the start. That what we now know is that early child development, not just education, but early childhood development is an important social determinant of health. Now, I'll take the, uh, the clicker dicker there. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, why is early childhood uh, development so important? You guys know all of the stuff that I'm going to be saying here. But what this is the work of my dear friend, um, uh, Clyde Hertzman. And you know, what he was able to do, along with many, many other researchers, was prove that what happens early has a massive influence on what happens afterwards. That the building blocks of early child development, uh, in the words of the, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, they talk about the architecture for life either being a sturdy architecture or a weak architecture. So when I talk to my buddies who are early childhood educators, uh, who I've learned more from uh, than the other professions that I, uh, that I encounter, I talk about, as you know, that the work that you do as early childhood educators, you are neuroplasticians. Neuro being the brain, working with the plastic brain of children, you are neuroplasticians. So it should be R-E-C-E-N-P, yeah. neuroplastician. <laughs> so why is this so important? Why is it so important? Well, 
the, there are some great minds across the world who have looked at why is it that some people are healthy and others are not. And I'm going to suggest to you from the work of these great giants that what we're learning is that the brain systems and the immune systems, the health systems, get built in the early years. What Sir Michael Marmot, who wrote this report, Closing the Gap in a Generation in 2008, he said that poor social policies, unfair economics and bad politics are killing people on a grand scale. So he looked at Botswana, he looked at various countries, and he saw that the life expectancy was very different in one country to another. So in Botswana, uh, it was about the expectancy for a woman is about 45, whereas in Japan, it's about 80 years of age. So you can think, oh yeah, well, you know, I can imagine poor Botswana and all of the issues there. So uh, he then, though, looked at Glasgow, and as some of you have heard, that is the center of the universe. <laughs> so he looked at Glasgow, and what he found in Glasgow is that between two different neighborhoods, there was a 26-year gap. 26-year gap. So in his report, um, Equity from the Closing the Gap in a Generation, there's a whole chapter, chapter five, that looks at early child development as a social determinant of health. Now I'm going to tell you that it's not just Glasgow that this is important in, that it's also, I'll show you our EDI results that show that even in Hamilton, Ontario, there is a huge discrepancy between where I live on the West Mountain and where my brother teaches in inner city Hamilton. 21 year difference. Now you might say to yourself, how does this come about? How can we have such disparities in Canada, an amazing country? Well, I say that we have to look to see what are some of our guiding principles? What are some of the, the challenges and the beliefs that we hold close to our hearts and that guide us? And as I look for that, I find that we don't really have a very good North Star to believe in. But when we look at our First Nations, when we look at some of our newcomer and immigrant populations and cultures, we see that they do. Our First Nations people, and I learned this from Tom Porter, says that our children are our sacred ones. They are the heart of the community and that it is our sacred responsibility to raise our children. Well, let me tell you, if you truly believe that our children are the sacred ones, you would have no need for the disciplinary committee that we heard outlined the, the capacities that they look at. If we truly believe, have the North Star of are we treating our children in this sacred way, we would have a very, very different way of interacting. We would be asking ourselves, what is our view of the child? Do we see that child as a precious spark, a precious gift? Do we see them full of possibility and curiosity? Or do we think that they're empty vessels that we have to stuff the duck? That we have to get our wonderful adult directed stuff into? Well, I'm going to say that I think that we've had an educational system that is hugely changing but that has been very much focusing on stuffing the duck, on getting what we know children need, supposedly, into them, rather than thinking about the sacred and uniqueness of each child. Our First Nations people tell us that our children with special rights, not special needs, part of a revolution here, we need to be talking about kids with special rights, not special needs, but that they are given to us for a very special reason. But you know, the other stuff that science is telling us is that what we do today is affecting children's biology. And that biology creates change in the DNA expression that lasts for seven generations. Our First Nations people say, think about the next seven generations when you're making decisions. Well, hello, America. 
Are you thinking seven generations? I'm not, no more, no more. But really, what does it mean? What does that really mean in your interaction with children on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm going to talk in a few minutes about are you connecting or are you correcting them or redirecting them? But in our interaction, you are building their capacity for empathy. You are uncovering their ability to be self-regulated and co-regulated by yourself and by others. So when you're sitting with your children, you're not just worrying about what's my moment-to-moment -moment activity, but you have to think about the next frickin' hundred years. <laughs> wow, are you ever getting paid the big bucks to do that too? We are going to change that too, guys. That's on the agenda. Thank you very much for wage enhancement. I'm, f I'm up for equal pay for work of equal value myself. I'm, I'm fighting for it for you. So do we need to worry about these big ideas? Well, I'll tell you, when we looked at Hamilton, we looked at, and when I say that's the royal we, uh, uh, people in Hamilton looked to see, are we seeing differences in our children's development across neighborhoods? The answer is a very big yes. But are we also seeing differences in their life expectancy across neighborhood? And the answer is, again, a very big yes. In Hamilton, they did a code red a series that looked at administrative data in hospitals, they looked at graduation rates, they looked at incarceration rates, and they see that there is a huge discrepancy. We need the work that you are doing in early childhood education to begin the leveling of the playing field so that it is equity from the start for all children. We need to change it so that your postal code is not going to determine how far you go in school. Your postal code should not determine how long you live, but we are more and more seeing that being the case. I'm telling you, the evidence is solid, guys. Go out there and fight for this. The work that you do will change and is changing that reality. That when we interact with children, when we build the kind of professionalism that you were hearing about tonight, you are creating the brains, the hearts, the immune systems of children that is going to give them the capacities to be able to think, to be able to make decisions, to be able to share and care about others. But you know, what we know is that it's not just early childhood education that creates the human. But I'm so proud to be in Ontario just now because my friend and dear colleague Clyde Hertzman in that chapter five talked about what are the environments that matter for children. And so you've got the child at the center and the child comes with their own unique characteristics that interact with the other children around them, that interacts with the family. There's a two way back and forth street. You know, you might think that um, a child development and if kids do well, it's all about the quality of the care. But you know, some of those little gaffers are pretty hard to care for. You know, they're pretty tough, they're prickly, they're uh, more challenging temperamentally. Well, we know that those kids with that temperament affect their environment. But if that environment isn't one that says, hey baby, I don't know how to help you stop crying, but I'm here for you no matter what. If we have an understanding that there is the interaction, then we can support the family. Well, how do we support the family? Well, I'm very pleased to have heard that there's 100,000 new childcare spaces being opened for zero to four year olds. But the very first thing I said to the associate minister is do not open a single one if it's not high quality. We don't want it if it's not high quality. Why is that? It's because we know that the environment that children live and grow in has a massive impact. 
So for our little kids who are vulnerable for whatever reason, if they are in poor quality childcare, they suffer. Their brains get altered in a very negative way. It has to be looking at the quality of the environment. But you know how well that mum and that family, those caregivers are going to be able to look after children depends on the safety of the community. The safety of the community depends on the environmental decisions that are made at the regional level. So we have an Ontario that is leading the field in Canada saying we care. We are an Ontario, I mean, I, I'm not paid to say this, but as I'm of seeing this, we are an Ontario that cares about our young kids and their parents, and we're going to find as much as we can to support them. Why? Because they know that what happens at the provincial level matters down the way. Now, we can say, well... We really want to do this because if we don't do it right, we pay a whole lot later. Well, I say to you, you're absolutely right. We know that if we invest a dollar now in children, particularly who are in, with families who are really, really struggling because of the conditions that we have created for them in terms of poverty and what happens when you live in poverty, if we have high-quality programs, we now know you get $13 for every dollar you spend. We know that we can get a massive return on the investment. We know that we can change our early development instrument uh, indicator results, but it takes all of us to understand why. Now, one of the mechanisms that people are approaching to see why is by thinking about it through the lens of the brain, which I love. And you guys all know, because you've heard me before, talk about the brain is our master organ. And it is built quite literally by the environment. It's no longer nature or nurture, even though it was lots of fun to drink and argue about it in university. It's not nature versus nurture, but it's nature interacting with nurture. So right down to the granular level, your college of early childhood educators is saying, we know that these negative interactions of early childhood educators with inappropriate discipline is bad for kids. It changes their brain. We are not going to have that as part of our profession. We're not going to let that go. We're not going to have the door closed and go on with your business. The brain is altered by these experiences. Now, here's a lovely little video. Oops, and it's of my grandson. Oh, imagine that. So here's a little video. Show me it down. Oh. Mm -hmm. Two weeks old. <laughs> Is that not greatness? Is that not <laughs> greatness? But <laughs> that's my Liam and my son, my big boy Andrew. But this, I show you this because I'm a very proud nana. But also, are we creating that love in our childcare, in our infant programs? The baby's brain is built by that serve and return. Are we making sure that all adults working with our kids have their eyes lit up? when that child enters the room or you enter the room. And how about does the child's eyes light up when they see you? How about that as one of the objectives of the three goals? I am going to make sure that the kids in my care, their eyes light up. So you guys have seen all of these slides that show you the evidence why we know that what happens in the early years builds the brain. We know that poor kids, on average in this study, only heard 13 million words in their first three years, compared to 43 million words. So remember, neuroplasticians, brain cells are turned on and activated by the environmental stimulus. So if you only hear 13 million words, that's how many connections you make. But if you hear 43 million words, if those 43 million words are full of uh, positive affirmations, your brain, your view of yourself, your regulation is built by that. 
But if you only hear 13 million words, a lot of them are going to be, don't do that, stop it, come here, right now. And what we know from these studies is that these kids who had poor quality experiences at home, they heard fewer words, and more of the words they heard were about, don't do that. They were corrections, not connections. So this is, I told you I wasn't going to be able to go through all the slides, so this is uh, the Hart and Risley. The language that kids get built and surrounded in builds their brain. Now, it's not iPads that build the brain. It's not television. It is child-directed speech, speech directed straight to the child. So how are we doing in Ontario? How are we doing in Canada? Well, my buddy the late Dr. Dan Offord was very curious about this, and he's the one about what, 12, 15 years ago developed the early development instrument. Kindergarten teachers complete it. It's just a checklist, 106 questions on these domains, and then they aggregate it up at the, at the, uh, at the provincial level, at the school level, at the board level, and what we know is that Ontario's children, about 30% of them are arriving at school without the skills they need to do well. So this is a wake-up call, 30%. That's not, that does not include the children who already have identified special needs. So that's a wake-up call. That's a wake-up call that says, hey, bring on more early childhood education and bring on more direct supports to parents to help them be the best parents they can be and we'll bring that vulnerability down. We can and we see it in communities that come together where there's high quality childcare, working with community collaborations like OEYC, F's Family Child Centers, like community hubs, that they actually can diminish the vulnerability of the kids. Why? Because we're all saying these children are our sacred ones. How can we all work together to make sure that they do well? Now, we need to be thinking about all the kids. This stuff from Australia, I'd love to be able to, Shannon, I want to be able to do the Ontario slide here. Where are you, Shannon? I want Ontario data up here soon. But what we know is that the greatest percentage may be poor, where the vulnerability is, but the greatest number is in the middle class. So what we need is universal access, but we may need different conditions for different families to support them in being able to have their children reach the potential that they need. So next concept quickly is we know stress mucks up your brain. Right, it's very scientific term, mucks up your brain. <laughs> so what we know is that when you come and you come across a bear, your body goes into a system of watch out. We have systems in our brain, in our body, to make us be ready for that alarm. Now here's the problem. If you are in conditions of high neglect or maltreatment or in poor quality childcare, your body turns on your stress response system and it stays on. We need the work of the college to make sure that our kids are not being overly stressed because it changes the brain. When you are overly stressed, you're, we all look, if we were all under massive stress here, we'd all look like we have ADHD. So the last concept I want to talk about, and just close your eyes while I flick through some slides, because that's really good. Oh, and that would be really good too, but oh, no, we don't have time. I'm only, only joking, only joking. So what we know is that the impact of toxic stress, but I want to talk to you about another concept, and that is the stress of early childhood educators. We're not talking nearly enough about how stressful it is to be a teacher, an educator, an early childhood educator in Ontario. And I, I ask the college to really look at what can you do as a regulatory body to build the capacity within the, the profession to manage the stress, not only of the work, because it is stressful, it's hard to imagine being in front of kids all the day and in front and with, but what are we doing? Because what we know is that when teachers are stressed, kids get stressed. And until we think of leadership 
as leadership also involving the emotional well-being, the self-reflective practice, we really need to get to the heart of things. Why? Last concept is because it changes the DNA. Just a minor concept, by the way, that the expression of our DNA gets altered by experiences. And what the science is telling us so far is that stress changes how the DNA gets messages and it can affect how our immune system operates later in life. Is that making sense? Our First Nations people said that we have intergenerational transmission of trauma. We now need to recognize that toxic stress takes many forms, but it gets transmitted intergenerationally. But here is the work of the early childhood education profession. We know that children who are living in conditions of toxic stress when they come in to an environment of high quality childcare, that you can change the expression of that DNA by those high quality experiences. That the quality of interactions makes a huge difference. So as we think about a profession that says our job is about connecting and educating, we need to be thinking about what's the stress our children experience and are we correcting them and thinking about how they should act or are we following the practice guidelines, thank you Melanie, that are being developed by your college. So we have a choice. We have a choice. We can think about our children's well-being and what we have to do about it and what we have as a role to do. The Cree tell us that we have a choice. A Cree elder, I heard this story out west, says that life is hard. Am I going to work really hard to do emergent curriculum when it's so much simpler just to do themes and cutouts? Am I really going to go for inquiry-based learning? Oh my gosh. Am I going to really think about a sense of belonging, well-being, expression? Or am I just going to back to go the old ways, where it was easier, where people told me what to do? He says that we've got these struggles going on in our, in our brains, in our hearts all the time. It's as if we've got two wolves, one who is kind and generous and curious and emergent, and one that is angry and nasty and lacks joy. And one of the little ones up front says, Grandfather, tell me which one wins if they're like wolves battling. And he said, it depends which one you feed the most. We now live in Ontario, in, in an Ontario that says we are progressively valuing the work of early childhood educators. We're in an Ontario that I continue along with you that fights for equal work, equal pay, equal value, because the work that you do is building the joy and the wonder of today and the future that's going to be fit for all of us in Canada. So guys, thank you so much. Merci, merci. It is a wonderful profession, and I am so proud to have a little bit of connection to what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you.